Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, and if you're in the Asia, Asian Pacific area, good morning. So this is the first lecture of our second season, uh, the ICG's public lecture on corporate governance. Uh, the Institute for Corporate Governance, ICG at Cali, was founded in 2004. It has been hibernation mode for about 15 years. And starting last year, we have hosted a series of public lectures on corporate governance. So we're hoping to become one of the world's premier research institute on corporate governance. And the ECGI, the European Corporate Governance Institute, and AU's Orstrom Workshop have kindly co-hosted our public lectures. Coming up is what we have. Uh, in the last year, Professor Alex Eichmann started the lecture by discussing ESG related issues. And then we have two lectures on institutional investors role, one on indexers, one on hedge funds. After that, we talk about the board of directors how does reputation give them the incentive to monitor and monitor effectively? And then we have a three lecture series on data and technology. We started with the new challenges and opportunities provided by data and technology, and we went into the details of data governance. So for this year, we also scheduled seven lectures. Today, we have Professor Donald Legenbord talking about insider trading. So this is taking the perspective of insider's mind. What do they think? What is the calculation and miscalculation on their side when they commit fraud? Next month, we have Professor Miriam Bayer talking from the perspective of public enforcers. So when they investigate and prosecute these white collar crimes, what are the challenges they face? So after that, we have two lectures on general corporate governance issues and executive compensation. And we have climate risk after that, corporate culture and sustainability. So for this coming year, our lecture speakers come from uh, the legal side, accounting side, finance side, marketing side, and management side. So I'm starting each lecture, but my IEO colleagues are going to host most of these lectures with one exception, uh, Marco, Beck is from ECGI. So Marco is our co-host of the entire series. So he's going to moderate Laura's speech on climate risk. Lastly, our co-host today, Todd Hall is my colleague at Cali School of Business. He's associate professor of law, business law and ethics. His own research is on wet collar and corporate crime. He look into business behavioral ethics and federal sentencing policy. So Todd is an expert in the area. Todd has published many articles in top law and uh, business journals, and his research was frequently cited in all those public, uh, popular, and important national news outlets. So Professor Todd Hall has won numerous research and teaching awards. Without further ado, Todd, uh, please take it away. So this is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, June. Uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, a true giant in the field of securities law. So Professor Donald Langford is the Thomas Aquinas Reynolds Professor of Law at Georgetown, where he has taught contract securities regulation and various courses related to corporate and securities law since 1999. Prior to joining the faculty at Georgetown, Professor Langbort was the Lee S. and Charles A. Spear Professor at Vanderbilt University School of Law. A prolific scholar, uh, he has published nearly 100 journal articles or book chapters, along with authoring uh, four different texts on the topics of securities law, insider trading, and corporate compliance. Uh, and he often brings tools of behavioral economics and behavioral ethics to bear on those subjects. Uh, to say his work has uh, had influence is a vast, vast understatement. So not only has it impacted the thinking of academics, uh, this moderator included, uh, and the business community at large, uh, his work has also shaped the thinking of judges and lawmakers as well through numerous amicus briefs and rounds of congressional testimony. 
uh, and his regular media contributions uh, to major news outlets help inform the public in all things securities law. So we are uh, simply just thrilled to have Don here today to discuss his newest take on state of mind puzzles in insider trading, uh, a topic that I find uh, maddeningly, maddeningly complex, uh, <laughs> partly because of the origins of insider trading law, uh, partly because of the law's securitist evolution, and that's particularly as to tipper tippy liability, and partly because of how it demands an interdisciplinary behavioral approach to fully understand and appreciate. Uh, so that's maddening, but it's also a whole lot of fun to puzzle through. Uh, and there's no one better to help us do that uh, than Don Landwehr. So Don, uh, please take it away. All right. Uh, thank you, Todd. And thank you for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. Um, it's also a fun subject to take on. Uh, so I hope we have a good time. Um, I was asked uh, perhaps to talk about insider trading. Uh, I noticed the, my host is the Institute for Corporate Governance, and therefore I'm making a very deliberate effort here to tie insider trading to corporate governance, not something that is always done, and, and that makes for an interesting uh, journey. Um, I begin with the question, what were they thinking? Uh, which comes in two distinct forms. To lawyers, it's a legal question. Insider trading as much or perhaps more than other white collar crimes depends on very intricate assessments of state of mind. What were they thinking in order to decide whether the elements of a cause of action for insider trading uh, are, are satisfied? That's the legal approach to what were they thinking. Um, but to, the, to most people, the more interesting question is, what were they thinking in advance of something that gets them into deep trouble, often jail? Uh, and that's a question that is very different from, um, from the legal questions. Uh, and it's the confusion between the two that I find most interesting. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, to say that, as Todd did, that state of mind questions for purposes of insider trading, enforcement, and prosecution are muddled is an understatement. I love to give the following hypothetical to my students or groups of lawyers who want to learn more about insider trading. Uh, imagine, and I this is a young person question, uh, to, to engage my students. Suppose you've just taken a job at a law firm and you're, you're, you've been given responsibility for mergers and acquisition transactions. Um, you get a day off, you fly home to have dinner with your parents. And in the course of dinner, you say out loud over the dinner table, you know, this is a great job. Let me tell you about one of the cases I'm working on one of the M&A matters I'm working on. And you delve into a, a little bit. Uh, and after dinner, your father excuses himself, uh, walks upstairs, picks up the telephone and calls a stockbroker uh, and buys or sells as the case may be. Um, some stock based on that dining room conversation. Who's liable if anybody? And the answer is, we have to go into the mind of the young lawyer uh, and ask, what were you thinking when you opened your mouth to um, tell about a confidential matter? Um, was it, A, that you were just oblivious to anything and proud of your work and you knew your parents would be proud of you, so you blurted it out? What about that? Or perhaps was it, you know, parents helped me with the tuition through law school. Uh, maybe it's time for a little payback. That's a very different story. Getting into the mind of the person um, is absolutely essential because under one approach, you are liable as well as your father if you were seeking a personal benefit. 
in passing this information on. And that's a possibility. On the other hand, if you were just oblivious and implicitly trusting your father, he could go to jail, but you don't. That's a very different state of mind. So again, Todd is right. As we delve into this, we're dealing with very intricate questions of what was actually in perception um, during the dinner conversation. But I want to switch and spend most of my time dealing with the other way of posing the question. What were you thinking as an expression of exasperation? What indeed uh, is going on? Um, there are many insider trading cases where you have to ask that question. And I'll be dealing with some of the famous ones in my talk today. Uh, recently, we've added to, I think, the top of the list, um, an insider trading case that the SEC and federal prosecutors have brought against a former secretary and head of corporate disclosure at Apple Computer, who liquidated his both bought and sold stock in Apple because he was on the disclosure committee and he was getting early access uh, to all the earnings releases, positive and negative. Um, he was also head of compliance. So literally you had, and this is the what were you thinking moment, a person who has that much compliance responsibility at in the morning sending emails out saying, we are now in blackout condition, you may not trade and four o'clock in the afternoon executed a trade where he unloaded a large portion of his investment. What were you thinking? And he did it through his own account. It wasn't like he was trying to hide it uh, terribly well. And, and we'll be getting into some of the stories. Uh, I've been greatly influenced by the work of Eugene Sultan uh, at Harvard Business School, uh, who has a book called Why They Do It. Uh, where he sits down with white collar criminals and has them retrace the what was going on in your head. I think this is a very valuable exercise for reasons uh, I'm going to stress in the course of talking about corporate governance. Um, even though I think as, as Eugene concedes in his book, you never know when you sit down and interview somebody whether they're telling you what actually went on in their minds, as opposed to what their current approach is um, to their own guilt or their own involvement. Um, and for that reason, uh, as Todd mentioned, I tend to go beyond the anecdotal uh, to draw from behavioral ethics, behavioral economics, um, to look at other ways of shedding a light on what were they thinking. Because in the end, as a matter of corporate governance, if you wanna control the risk of liability, you have to understand why it's happening. And I have long said, and I think it's right, that one of the flaws in modern compliance is we spend a lot of time imagining the mind of the person who cheats. Uh, without quite testing whether this is the best, most sophisticated story. And my context for all this, and I'm going to keep an eye on our time, is a decision by the SEC uh, last January uh, to issue proposed rulemaking on insider trading, something that happens very rarely. The SEC, as a rulemaker, uh, has largely been playing a small role compared to the SEC as an enforcer. Uh, and and judge-made law has tended to supersede um, rulemaking. But this time, it looks like the SEC will step up and make major reforms, one of which will be a requirement that publicly traded companies disclose and report on their insider trading in, uh, 
procedures um, so that the investing public can assess what they're doing and what they're doing to prevent uh, another what were they thinking moment. And it's in the context of that governance reform that I, I want to talk about the psychology uh, of insider trading today. Um, I was moved to say much of what's in my paper, uh, specifically on this subject, by an article in the Journal of Financial Economics in 2017 uh, by Usman Ali and David Hirschleifer. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Hirschleifer's work. He's a very well-known um, economist dealing with um, these kinds of situations uh, that studied the extent to which opportunism varies among firms and among executives, who's aggressive, who's not, and what that correlates with, um, which I found very interesting because of the connection to my own work and something I'm going to be uh, stressing over the course of our discussion today. They find, not surprisingly, that there is a variation, a predictable variation uh, in the degree to which executives test the line, some being very cautious and staying short of it, others going beyond the line um, with some degree of regularity. Um, that's interesting by itself, and that gets much of the attention in the article. But the punchline for me that was most interesting is that the companies that have executives who step over the line consistently in terms of the aggressiveness of their insider trading, the risk they're willing to take, um, correlates strongly with various measures of corporate governance and corporate outcomes. Most importantly for me is other forms of violation of the securities laws um, that have nothing to do with insider trade. Uh, and, and thus their ultimate conclusion is culturally tolerated evidence of aggressive insider trading by senior executives puts the whole company at greater risk uh, of agency cost type problems. Um, so that we can't just dismiss insider trading as different from and just a sidelight to corporate governance, but it goes actually to the core. It, it signals the presence of a culture that can be bothersome. Uh, and I've always taken the position that a good compliance program or good corporate governance, board members, compliance professionals, uh, really need an accurate assessment of why trading happens and crosses the line or not. Um, before, they, before you can say how to deploy resources to deter it, to um, sanction it, to discover it, all the things that are part of the compliance person's toolkit. Uh, and the message that Ali and Hirschloot Pfeiffer um, very much want to bring home is this is a board of directors issue. This is deep corporate governance because in the end, it's something about the risk-taking culture uh, that is putting not only the executives at risk for insider trading um, but the company as a whole. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. And what I want to do, and this is designed entirely to be interesting, uh, is to talk about some of the findings from behavioral ethics and behavioral finance um, that relate to insider trading, that where you can take an idea and shed some light on the probability and impact associated with uh, violating the law. Um, let me start with the first, and it's not really uh, behavioral ethics at all, 
it, it's the rational choice argument that we just so under enforce insider trading laws that it's worth the money. Uh, it's worth the risk to make the money. Um, that certainly is true. There's a wide body of empirical work on trying to estimate how much insider trading there is in our financial markets. Obviously a, a challenge to get a precise measurement, but uh, lots of work on the subject. It's also well understood among compliance people and lawyers that there are lots of misperceptions out there about the risk of getting caught. Uh, and so the first thing I wanna put on the table is when you talk to lots of executives as Eugene Soltish did after the fact, in hindsight, why did you do this? The idea of getting caught was way back of mind uh, and not the sort of thing that interrupted the, the rather instinctive, gee, I have some money to make here, let's do it, to execute the trade. Um, what people don't know, and I think leads sometimes to significant misestimation, and I wouldn't want boards uh, exercising their control over insider trading to fall into the trap of believing these things, is that if you trade in small enough lots, you just fly under the radar. Um, we actually know that both FINRA and the SEC, the two primary securities regulators, have increasingly sophisticated um, software that can be put to use to find very subtle alterations in trading patterns just before the announcement of some, um, some event. In other words, the software, uh, the machine learning is getting more and more sophisticated. And if anybody gets caught, then all of a sudden, and it's plausible to argue they got inside information. It's the easiest thing in the world to push some buttons in this, in the high tech systems um, to show you anyone who had any connection with the same people. And all of a sudden you see branching and connections and networks going on. Um, all of which can mean if the SEC decides to pursue the case, um, it, it's working from day one with a list of names and quantities traded uh, by everybody who bought or sold in the right direction um, during that period of time. Um, as a result, you get caught because not because you traded in a certain amount, big or small, um, but because the aggregate trading that shows up as an anomaly in the software, um, everybody on that list can be a subject. And the SEC likes to say, Let's go after the people at the bottom of the list just to send a message that there's nothing too small to, to justify uh, SEC enforcement. Um, so that's one possibility. I think if I were advising a board on the creation of uh, insider trading restrictions, procedures, uh, I would want first and foremost for there to be an accurate risk perception of enforcement, not an anecdotal one, um, which drives too much. Um, next, do they do it for the money? And there is a relatively famous journal uh, article uh, with that as its title um, to look into whether putting aside accurate estimation or um, risk misestimation, um, whether what's driving the desire is money. And here again, some interesting findings from the world of behavioral ethics and behavioral economics that would lead us to believe that if you want to tell the follow the money story, it may not be getting 
everything. Uh, it, it may not be getting the most important things. Um, ego is one of my favorites. I, I write a lot about ego and overconfidence and a cluster of largely male traits um, that lead to aggressive risk taking. Um, from that literature, it's not hard to derive that once people pass a certain level of wealth, um, self-perception and perception by others is not, have you added another million or $5 million to your wealth? It's, you have status now that you can wave in front of everybody else uh, and, and treat them as someone uh, who needs to uh, be looked up to. Um, I want to read some reports from journalists and others. Uh, Rumi Khan, who is involved in one of the major insider trading rings during the period of time uh, we were looking into hedge funds, the SEC was looking into hedge funds. Um, she was put to work setting up the links in the network that would move information from its source um, to the Galleon hedge funds. Um, and in response to the question, was this about the money? Uh, was that how you explain uh, the structure of the deal? She said, um, no, insider traders try to be casual and friendly. People are most easily persuaded to share if they're made to feel powerful, wanted, and included in the upper echelon of financial society. When you see that as a motivator, as well as, or maybe even more than the money that's involved, um, you see that telling the story from a compliance perspective, what is the kind of behavior we're trying to reach, shouldn't be based on a mental model that this is all about getting rich. Um, let me give you another one. This is from Eugene Solch's book. Um, and it comes out of the Galleon matter as well. Um, the tippy ultimate user of the information, uh, Raj Rajaratnam, played to Kamar's self a sense of self-worth and competitiveness by suggesting that he wasn't necessarily earning his compensation compared to other sources. There were paybacks here. Uh, and to a very rich man, the amount of the payback really didn't matter that much. But what got him going and what moved him into a hyperdrive in terms of the value of the secrets he was passing on was he wanted to be number one in the value of his tips and was willing to do nearly anything once told he was now in second or third place. It worked like a charm. Adds, if Roger Atnam had simply asked Kumar to give him inside information during the initial conversation, Kumar would have certainly been taken aback and declined. That's right. But once he's suckered along, once, once Rajaratnam uses the competitive position, um, things change. And this relates to another matter that I'm going to turn to uh, in, in a few minutes. Um, my favorite story, it fascinates everybody and it is maybe still number one on the list of the why they did they do it question involves Martha Stewart. Uh, Martha Stewart, everybody knows uh, for her television uh, appearances and she is a, one of the most successful women in the world. Um, owner of 97% of the voting stock of Martha Stewart Omnimedia. Um, and here's her story. Uh, as a celebrity, she has lots of contacts and was actually getting a lot of invest investment bankers to come to her because of a variety of positions. 
um, and try to buy her favor. And at the time, 15 years ago, we were dealing with flipping and other IPO abuses, um, part of which dealt, uh, dealt with bankers using allocations in IPOs, initial public offerings, um, to get somebody to steer business to them, quid pro quo. Um, Martha Stewart was a favorite of the bankers. Um, anybody who reads the literature on IPOs knows that if you've been allocated shares, it's a good idea to sell them before too long. Um, the value in IPOs is strong in a very short term horizon. Over the long run, nothing special. So take your money early. Martha Stewart disregarded that basic advice and held up on dearly as if it were some great prize all these matters, only to hit a bump in the economy where all the high-tech shares were coming down in value. And she had losers, loser, loser after loser. She didn't do what was smart. And she realized this ultimately and was very ashamed. There was only one company she still had in positive value territory, uh, a company called Implant. And one night she was flying to Mexico on her private jet uh, and got a phone call as during a refueling stop uh, from her broker at Merrill Lynch in New York saying, uh, uh-oh, Imclone is dropping in value. The Waxels, the founding, father, uh, the founding family behind Imclone, were selling. What do you want us to do? Now, to a lawyer, the answer would be, hang up the phone. You've got inside information. The answer is, don't try to outthink this. You should have sold a while ago. Um, she describes being sick to her stomach at that point, literally sick to her stomach and overwhelmed by shame and guilt for not having sold when she should have sold. She then blurts out, sell it all. She makes, she avoids a loss of $47,000 by doing that. She is worth how many hundreds of millions of dollars? Who knows? She also executes that trade through Merrill Lynch with her name on the trade. She's not hiding anything. Amazing. She then realizes what she's done, calls the broker, and they enter into a conspiracy to cover up the trading. It's that for which she goes to jail. Uh, but the SEC brings an insider trading action against her. This is the one that defies imagination. Why would you ever? But she was trained as a stockbroker, so she knew the, uh, knew, knew the rules. Um, and the answer screams out when you look at her trading patterns and what she didn't do. She was absolutely angry at herself for not selling. And what behavioral ethics teaches us is the mind will become very self-protective at that point. Now, it's very easy, and I don't think this is entirely specious, um, to say that when Martha got this phone call, she could have interpreted it as saying there has been a public announcement that M clone is not being approved by the FDA, such that there's now a stampede to sell, uh, but it's based on public information. But it wasn't, and a couple questions could have determined that. But if you're beating yourself up, if you are driven by shame and ego threats, you don't think right. And 
I think the shame is the explanation there. Uh, another illustration of the list of motivations for insider trading um, that can be um, very, very powerful and that any system of internal controls um, is gonna have to deal with. Another part of the story worth building into the complexity, um, doing things for others. Uh, one of the famous teachings uh, in behavioral eth ethics is people will take much greater ethical and legal risks to do a favor for a loved one than they would to line their own pockets. Whatever their degree of risk preference is, it grows greater when a friend or relative is the beneficiary um, of the, the tip, the trade, whatever it's going to be. Uh, I'll come back to an illustration of that in a minute. Next, legal construal. A thing that anybody who works in the entire trading space quickly becomes aware of is how many executives not only misperceive the risk of the risk of enforcement, but misperceive the law. Now, I think this is motivated inference. I don't think this is a, a clear-eyed assessment, but here are some things you hear over and over. First of all, that information is material and non-public only if it's a sure thing, only if we know this is going to happen. We know the company's earnings are X instead of Y. Um, in fact, materiality captures situations well short of certainty, well within uh, the category of speculation. Um, things that are interesting possibilities are often material non-public information. Anybody who thinks otherwise has, is running the risk of st stepping into um, a big mess. Uh, people who overestimate their own brain power and its contribution to a decision to buy or sell stock uh, compared to the value of the tip or the information that was delivered. No, if it was my, you know, I came to this conclusion. The information just confirmed it. Uh oh, you could be going to jail for that. Um, these kinds of misperceptions. Um, I was fascinated, uh, and I encourage anybody out there in the corporate governance space who works with pharmaceutical companies uh, in the big in the pharma area. Um, an assessment by Alan Horwich, a wonderful lawyer who teaches at Northwestern as an adjunct, uh, who's a specialist in big pharma, uh, who points out that clinical trials are a walking laboratory for insider trading violations. Some of it's obvious. If you get inside information from the Fed Food and Drug Administration about what they're going to do, um, that's, of course, inside information. Uh, if it's less clear than that, it's probably still material. But what he was saying is go into a hospital during clinical trials and you will watch doctors involved in the clinical trials talking to patients and talking to each other about how the cl clinical trials are going. And often it's just designed to pump up the, the patients, the ones who are in, um, in, in the trial. But the conversation is, you know, we just got approval from the FDA last week. We are all set to go forward with another round. It's working. You know, that's all from the law of medicine. That's all a conversation that's happening in the healthcare space. It's also inside information. And there have been numerous 
there are hundreds of insider trading cases brought in connection with clinical trials. There are some that take this road um, to leakage that is occurring in hospitals among doctors without them linking it to insider trading or public company responsibilities. Uh, again, a bad misperception. Um, slippery slopes. I am fascinated. One of my favorite behavioral ethics findings has to do with the, how somebody gets in trouble for some kind of ethical or legal violation, step by step. You take a first step, it may be innocent, almost certainly lawful. But by taking that step in the direction of problematic behavior, the, the line resets. And next time you take another step and you get closer to the line and it's still becoming normalized. So you take another step and the line moves. It's a classic form of the slippery slope road uh, to ethical violations. We see this in any number of areas. Uh, what it's saying, sort of like what I mentioned before, is when you take the first step, you wouldn't have taken the last step. You'd say to yourself, I'm, I'm better than that. But once you took the first and the second and the third, it's hard to tell yourself, and this is just straight cognitive dissonance. It's hard to tell yourself that you've been doing anything wrong and if there's nothing wrong with it, might as well continue. And on and on and on. Uh, I, I will leave for people to just envision. There is a picture I could have shown had I had slides, but I didn't want any other slides. Um, and that's neuroscientists who have taken, uh, neuroscientists who take picture of the amygdala, um, as it is under stress, uh, we know that moral dilemmas, ethical dilemmas uh, are processed, the gut feelings uh, through the amygdala. Uh, and at the outset, when you pose an ethical dilemma to somebody, um, the amygdala lights up in terms of the electricity generated in the brain. It's, it really is engaging. Uh, consistent with what I said before, at that point, at this point, you'd never do the ultimate wrong thing. But the second time it's stimulated, it's a little darker. The energy is less. Third, even less. By the fifth or sixth time, the amygdala has dimmed the darkness. That's to me, one of the most evocative images of what you've got to watch out for in the world of enforcement, in the world of trying to control ethical violations and behavioral violations. Uh, it really brings home in ways that I think corporate executives, CEOs, board members ought to see before they say, oh, I'm a good person. I would never do the bad thing. Become situationally involved in something that takes you step by step. And yes, you would. Uh, there's a famous Journal of Finance article um, that, said, that, that, that uh, examines step by step behaviors that get a company in trouble with the SEC. Um, and it's almost always that there were about 10 steps, the first five of which were probably not illegal. But once you set on that course, there's no way to effectively stop you. Uh, and again, an important message to people who are trying to control any kind of risk, in including uh, all of this. Let me read from the Martoma case, which is a clinical trials case. Um, 
an interview by a very well-known journalist in the New Yorker. The tipper in the case, Dr. Gilman, slid quickly. He recalled a moment when Martoma asked repeatedly about the side effects one might expect to see from the drug that was being tested. I didn't quite recognize it for what, it, for what I would think it was, which was an attempt to find material non-public information, Gilman said. First, so first he offered the, theoretical responses, but Martoma persisted in wanting to know what really happened. And finally the answer slipped out. After that moment, there was no stopping the tips from just moving forward. It took those steps to get there. Once there was a moral license of the conversation, then the crash and burn of the tips um, becomes obvious. Two others, and then we'll be finished. Eugene Sultan, in the book that I've now referred to multiple times, um, takes the position that the ultimate motivation for insider trading is whatever ego plus money incentive there is, um, filtered through rationalization. And the rationalization is very simple insider trading has no victims. Say those words in a courtroom or in a US attorney's office and you'll be beaten to death. But for those of us who know something about insider trading, it's often right that any single act of insider trading has no perceptible effect on the market price um, and poses no harm to the source of the information. Each of these can be damaging, but they are often not. And the mind that is processing, should I do this and take packaging together all the other influences I've talked about um, thus far, it becomes so easy to say, probably will be caught, will make me feel better in the eyes, make, make me look better in the eyes of my inner circle of people who know these things. Um, and no injury, no harm. Um, that's an interesting one because it's, as I said, not entirely untrue. Yet to engage in that, to see no harm whatsoever, diminishes the, the possibility that you'll see in a case where there is harm, um, that, that you can't persist in, in the same rationalization. Um, it's a tough one, but I think, and, and again, my work on compliance and, and enforcement in the behavioral area uh, is to talk to directors and officers and, and talk to compliance people. Um, in a way that asks them to think about how many rationalizations are out there that enable insider trading. Uh, this is one, this is a very powerful one. Um, and I don't think it's taken seriously enough uh, in the building of insider trading enforcement programs. Final one, um, culture. Uh, we've talked about corporate culture and I think Corporate cultures can evolve into risk-taking cultures that go viral in terms of the potential for wrongdoing that comes as a result. Um, in a global environment, uh, it's worth noting that if you do public opinion tests in the United States about is insider trading wrongful? Is it bad? Should it be, uh, should it be made lawful or made more criminal, um, there's about a 60, 65% uh, of the population that favors fairly in, uh, aggressive enforcement. And that's actually grown in the last 10 or 20 years. Go around the world and ask the same question and you get funny looks. Insider trading is seen as what elite status brings. 
And that, in a world in which CEOs and CFOs and boards of directors are increasingly diverse, increasingly multicultural, is a place where you have to worry a little bit. The deep-seated intuition, you shouldn't do this, may not be as widely shared around the boardroom as somebody steeped in US culture and US law uh, might think. So let me stop there. Um, all of this goes back to the Ali and Hirschleifer idea that you've got to really engage in the risk-taking culture. You've got to engage the risk-taking culture uh, if, if you want to effectively deal with insider trading. And so assuming the SEC goes ahead with its proposal to require um, reporting on insider trading, internal controls, uh, I think everything I've talked about today ought to be on the table not some simplistic model of here's how people operate um, when given the temptation to trade. So with that, I am done and we can turn to questions and answers. Great, uh, thank you so much, Don. Um, and, and I appreciate your comments. Uh, I encourage everyone, we'll give a link as best we can and post the paper um, as soon as we're able. Uh, it's a it's a it's a great read uh, for all the reasons Don sort of laid out, um, but but I also think it lays out some of the background of insider trading in a way uh, you know that's too much for a talk, but I think is really helpful to understand uh, kind of the landscape as well. So so let's pick up on that um, you know that last thread, and because there was a couple of questions that came in related to that. So this is one from uh, Lee Yan. Uh, that asked, in your view, what is the fundamental rationale from a law perspective for regulating insider trading? Okay. So uh, economists have long debated this, um, you know, whether insider trading improves uh, efficiency or market integrity. Um, and is there a simple criterion for regulating in insider trading? Say, what's the objective function of the regulator's social welfare, et cetera? That's, that's, a, that's a good place to start, I would say. Great question. Great question. Um, and as you hinted, uh, a matter of such dispute among legal and economic scholars um, that the predictable answer is there is no coherence, but there is a strong political will to make insider trading both unlawful and enforced uh, that has taken on a life of its own. And you've written about this. I've certainly delved into all of this. Um, It might take a while to give the full answer. Um, a financial economist or many financial economists, Larry Glaston at uh, Columbia is well known for this, um, make the claim that if insider trading is well acknowledged to exist in large amounts, uh, spreads will widen, uh, evidence of risk, um, Will take and the cost of capital will go up. Um, that if that's right, and, and Larry certainly believes that to be the case, and he's pretty well known. Um, that's a good policy reason to want to control in the name of um, encouraging capital formation. Um, the problem is that's all contestable and very hard to measure empirically. So most lawyers shift to analogies. Um, and one that is very pervasive is that insider trading is a form of embezzlement. Uh, and, you know, end of discussion. Of course, we make embezzlement a crime and we send people to jail without second thought when they've engaged in embezzlement. Uh, the problem is that flies right by this fundamental distinction between embezzlement and insider trading. In insider trading, you're not you're not taking out of the possession; uh, you're infringing on it. But the company still has the same information after the embezzlement that it had before, as opposed to a company uh, insider trading. 
uh, as opposed to the company where there's been an embezzlement and the money disappears. Um, among the things that impress me besides the cost of capital argument, um, the, the incentives on for corporate disclosure for corporate disclosure in a prompt, honest way can be interfered with by the temptation to engage in insider trading. Um, certainly holding back on inside information while you're doing your trading, if you have that much power, can be um, can be enriching. So what I have is a list of about seven or eight things that are argu good arguments in favor of prohibiting insider trading. Um, not one of which by itself is that persuasive, but in collection um, probably does justify um, the regulation. That said, and Todd, I know you've written about this and you've thought about this, to then it, it, assume I'm right, my, my, I have a collection of things that make it rational to regulate. Do I then declare the insider trader to deserve hellfire and damnation, um, like 12 years in jail, um, because of those rather intricate policy um, moves um, that are behind all this. I, I think there's a disconnect. And I have for a long time written about why that disconnect. Um, but that's separate from the question that's been asked. So let's go to another one. Uh, th thanks, uh, and and certainly, uh, you know, I have an interest, obviously, in that in that question, but also the the drivers of that question uh, and the drivers of both the deterrence piece, but also just the uh, you know the the enforcement piece as well. So so let's touch on that. So this comes from a colleague of mine, Matt Turk. Uh, for deterrence, how important is perceived level of enforcement versus actual enforcement? So the Martha Stewart case may be more salient because uh, of the public, um, you know, persona that she had, uh, versus you know the prosecution of a hundred obscure hedge funds. So, if perception matters, should the DOJ S SEC take advantage of that salience or availability bias when they're making their decisions? Sure, um, you know, I, and the background for all of this is my belief that securities regulation is wildly under-resourced. In, in, in the United States. We do it more and probably better than any other country, but it's still woefully short of the investment in compliance um, that you'd wanna make in order to get an optimal cost of capital or optimal um, si situation. Um, once you do that, you have to leverage using biases, using your heuristics. Um, so is it, surprising that in the world of insider trading, we've got not only Martha Stewart, but Mark Cuban, um, a, a shortstop for the Baltimore Orioles, um, one of pro golf's uh, greatest, list. they aren't there because they were the major wrongdoers, uh, but they sure are great in getting your article on the front page of the New York Times, uh, of the Wall Street Journal, as opposed to B3. Uh, or, or something like that. Um, I think there are both costs and benefits to using expression or symbol uh, in your enforcement program. Um, it has the value of upping the perception that you can be caught. Though I, as I listen to people, recount their experiences. Um, it, it's very much a matter of, yeah, I knew that people get caught, just not me. Uh, you know, the me exceptionalism um, it, it is very, very common and, and predictable. So to Matt's question, hi Matt, by the way, um, to that question, um, I think what the SEC is doing with celebrities, Kim Kardashian just this week uh, got into a non-insider trading problem with the SEC, uh, is, is building a brand for the SEC. Um, and the brand helps it 
in, in a search for resources, um, helps it get visibility in Congress that it might not have otherwise. I, I, th that's my theory uh, for why the big why the big names get more than justified attention uh, in, in enforcement decisions. Um, so as many people probably on this call know, and, and you spell out in the paper quite a bit, um, the insider trading has this long history. Um, uh, absent from that history is actually a statutory definition yeah. and, <laughs> right. uh, and a place in, in the securities law that defines it and says it's illegal in and of itself, essentially. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated than that, of course. Uh, but Donna Nagy um, and yeah. Maurer here asks, um, what would a statutory provision explicitly prohibiting securities trading on wrongfully obtained information affect uh, some of these you know, psychological rationalizations behind insider trading? And, and then I'll just tack on a, a little bit to, to this question, which is, you know, is this a function, is insider trading more of a function of our, our individual psychology, or is it a function of, um, of you know, opportunities and, and control mechanisms in organization? I imagine the answer is both, but I, I'd be well, interested in how, both, how you put those two together. Right, both plus culture. Yeah. Um, and you and I both well know, um, you, you can't write well about compliance or internal controls uh, without encountering the, if the culture isn't right, this isn't going to work. Um, so, you know, my main reaction, and I'm often a pessimist, um, is when you start using the word wrongful, which I happen to agree is the best word to use in a statutory uh, definition of insider trading, I'm on team uh, wrongful. Um, you invite the rationalization, the psychology that says, oh, me, wrongful? Um, and, you know, I've gone through some of them. There's a greater list. I don't think it will help the messaging at all. Uh, to me, the question, I've thought about the ideal insider trading statute for 30 years now. Um, you've got essentially three choices uh, in what a statute should look like. One, which is what the European Union has done, um, is basically prohibit it at all. Yep, just can't do it. Uh, the other is the Texas Gulf Sulfur supposed idea of equality of information, even playing field, uh, which is, you. you know, you can't trade. Um, I'm sorry, that, that folds in to all of this. Uh, the other is you essentially license all but theft. Um, in the middle, the compromise is wrongful. Um, and because I think it captures why people why 65% of the people who respond to polls um, think insider trading ought to be made illegal. They're thinking not in terms of equality of information. They're thinking in terms of this guy's a cheater. Um, I, I tend to favor that one. Um, so you know, to, to Donna's question, um, I don't think the rationalizations I describe or any of the biases that I described are going to go away uh, because Congress, I, I think it's simply more legitimate to have insider trading uh, regulation if you have uh, a, a license to do it from Congress. Um, so I'm going to ask two quick um, sort of shorter clarifying questions, and then I want to leave a, a larger one sort of about the future where you think enforcement is going uh, at the end. So uh, a couple quick ones here. So one comes from uh, Kirsten Mayer, who is a uh, compliance officer, former compliance officer. Uh, could you please clarify the point regarding the amygdala research? <laughs> is that being faced with an ethical dilemma repeatedly? 
is numbing or is it the slippery uh, slope point or are they different? So maybe that's a quick one. Um, the numbing, numbing is a perfectly good way of describing, I, I did it in terms of light and dark, um, but it's the same idea. Um, it's that in a high velocity organizational environment, people are gonna step over the line a little inadvertently and fairly innocently um, with some frequency. Um, if the system is such that they're faced with similar choices repeatedly within a, you know, within a limited time frame. What I described and what the amygdala imaging uh, shows is it gets gradually easier to become more aggressive um, with your ethical choices until the descent becomes so steep that you can't stop it. So we're talking about how, how to metaphorically, uh, which, which is the way I describe it, I, I don't care what the amygdala is doing or what it looks like, but it's surely an evocative image to watch the amygdala become less interested, less concerned about the third, the fourth, or the fifth time you're confronting a similar dilemma. I do a lot of work with financial services firms, retail financial services in particular. So you, know, you have registered representatives under pressure to sell certain products. Um, that's an over, the, uh, over and over. That's a repeat play situation. Different customers, different clients, perhaps, not always. Um, but very much one where the slippery slope risk needs to be addressed and showing compliance people the amygdala um, grabs their attention. Yeah, uh, that, that study caught my attention in your paper uh, very much. We think about white collar crime, almost all white collar crime is sort of these, oftentimes these very small steps. You know, there's no, uh, uh, you know, crime a passion of white collar crime uh, right. out there. Uh, so so I think that finding has is pretty wide uh, ranging effects as we think about lots of these situations. Um, since we're coming up on time, uh, first of all, I want to remind everybody, uh, Don will be answering some of the questions that are left over. So we'll make sure we uh, he, he responds to those and then we'll post those as part of the larger um, video and everything that goes up on the website. But let's, let's end uh, with this one, Don. Um, so we, there's been a lot of chatter from the Department of Justice recently and the SEC about um, more enforcement uh, just in the last couple of weeks in particular, but also um, in, in enforcement action. So looking at insider trading, uh, both uh, in industry, right? Uh, knowledge of the industry, what the industry is going to do. You see it, um, you know, uh, crypto and Bitcoin and things like that being being characterized by the SEC now as securities and therefore that giving insider trading liability. So where do you see the future of enforcement? And, and this is another question as well, just the future of the law in this area. It, where are we headed? Maybe that's a good place to, or what's your prognostication of where that uh, Right. Be? Um, it's, it's really tough because I don't think the SEC has the depth and the capacity. They're smart people, I, but they are under resourced and not entirely sure what crypto is such that we can have a solid policy dealing with uh, its enforcement. It is very ad hoc, ad hoc uh, and, and that's, that, that's what's been emphasized. Uh, I am convinced we need a new federal agency um, to deal with the financial system, um, different from what we have now. That's been kicked around for 30 years. Uh, it has politically no chance of going anywhere. So I say this uh, purely as a matter of cheap talk. It, it's, this, this isn't going anywhere. Um, yeah, I... I think a philosophy that emphasizes the morality play 
character of enforcement um, that isn't just about theories of liability, um, like equal playing field or um, duty to disclose all public information, but really gets into the let's go after bad guys uh, is very durable. Um, and whatever the SEC gets on its plate from crypto, from anything like that, uh, the story is always going to be to demonize. Um, maybe a little bit unfairly, uh, but, but demonize uh, securities law violators by making them seem worse than what uh, a deep dig in, into what they did actually is. Uh, and question whether that might create some more rationalizations. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, with that, thank you so much, Don. Uh, we appreciate your time uh, and your insights. I want to uh, turn it back over to June uh, quickly. Okay. Remarks. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dan, so much for giving us a wonderful talk. I've learned quite a bit. I did my research on insider trading for a little while. Now I can read into their minds to see how yes. they justify the behavior given such big penalty if they are caught. So, and you also almost like laid a roadmap how to do insider trading, how to start that justification a bit by bit. So that's very insightful, thank you. Uh, so next month we have a companion lecture will be done by Professor Miriam Bayer. And this is from the public enforcer's perspective. So given the potential negative impact of insider trading on companies and on the public, why it is so hard to enforce insider trading cases to prosecute these wrongdoers. So there are going to be challenges shared by uh, Miriam. Uh, I would I encourage you to join that uh, public lecture and share the information with your colleagues, friends, and students uh, who might be interested. So thanks again for uh, the ECGI and IU's Alstrom Workshop to co-host this series. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach us at ICG uh, website and all these lectures, including the videos, uh, dance paper, and a lot of time the slide deck, and also uh, the speakers and series of Q and A's will be uploaded to our ICG's blog. So it's right there, ICG blog. Uh, kelly.iu.edu, you can find all the past uh, ICG public lectures as well. So it's time to say um, good afternoon, good evening, and good night to all of you. I hope to see you soon again on the next public lecture. Thank you, uh, Dan. Thank you, Todd. Bye. <laughs>